Hello, I'm Torvald of Torvald's Leather Works, and this video is going to be about my hardened leather bazoo bands. Um, to start with, we're going to talk a little bit about my hardening process, uh, regardless of what you might think from just looking at my armor. It is not specifically a wax-hardened leather. I actually have a multi-stage process where I will use hot water to mold, shape, and dish it, and then it will get baked in an oven. Then it gets a full immersion wax bath, and then it gets baked in the oven again. So I'm using just about a little bit of every type of leather hardening method to uh, get the results that I do. The wax bath that I use also has a melting point of 180 degrees. So these are not going to get soft from simply sitting in sunlight or normal hot weather you would expect in, uh, in other states such as in uh, Southern California, Mexico, Texas, Florida. Uh, I even have customers in Australia. In fact, if it gets hot enough that my armor starts to soften up, the last thing you're going to be worried about is your armor. So, these are modeled off of a very traditional style of bazoo band, or basad, or one of any half a dozen other names that uh, came about from this. It was a fairly common arm armor throughout Asia Minor and Southern Russia. Now the word bazu band in itself really just is a generic term for arm armor and it covered not only what we think of as the stereotypical bazu band design, it even covered what people think of as a standard medieval design which would be a wraparound van brace and an elbow cop. Usually though they were connected with one to three different straps. But my bazu bands are modeled on what we think of as the stereotypical bazu band, which is a single large plate that covers from the wrist down past the elbow and then usually cups a bit around the point of the elbow. But then these are modified to meet Society for Creative Anachronism armored combat standards in that we also have to cover the side points of the elbow, which was something that was not done with the traditional types. So we'll be getting into all of the safety and design features of these here in just a minute. So what is it that appeals so much to the SCA about Bozzy bands? Well, I drop it into two categories. It's the simplicity of it and it's how streamlined it is. Now when I'm saying simplicity, you're looking at one large plate covering the leading edge of the forearm and all three points of the elbow, and then one plate that comes up over the top of the forearm. And there are no articulations here uh, that can be damaged. Uh, there is no gap in here that can be hit. I know from personal experience and the experience of friends of mine who wear a van brace and elbow combination that there are times that they just constantly get smacked right in that gap, right between the two. Uh, unless you've done something to make the elbow cop a bit oversized so that it overlaps that, that van brace, somehow people manage to find that one little gap in your armor. And of course with these, there is no gap. Um, so the simplicity of the design certainly appeals to us. The streamlining of it makes these wonderful for hidden armor. If you're doing a very early period kit uh, or a lower ranked persona where you wouldn't have any arm armor. It makes it very easy for you to simply make a fighting tunic with blousier sleeves or slightly looser sleeves than you might normally wear and you can put these underneath. And it appeals to the later period uh, for the same reason. If you're doing, say, the German Lance Connect bit, uh, they have the nice blousey puffy sleeves and again these are very easy to wear underneath those types of sleeves. Um, one of the wonderful things about this design as well, especially with the way that I have modified the design and tinkered with it over time, is it gives you complete full range of motion. Now, you see me here getting this on by myself with no help. And there is a little bit of a trick to it. When you're doing this, you want to pop it over the lip that I have. And then you're going to pull the strap down, put the buckle in the center hole, 
and you're not going to put the tongue in immediately. You're going to let it snap back up onto the lip first so it puts tension on the strap and then you can easily just tuck that end of the tongue into the buckle. And then you're going to take your elbow strap and you're going to slide it on. Now this one you don't want to be tight. You essentially just want it to be down to where it's touching the skin on your arm. Uh, and then you will go ahead and you will buckle it. Thing is, after we get down to the padding section here, but you have to understand that this elbow strap is not actually holding this on. All it is doing is it's stopping this section of the elbow from pulling too far away from your elbow. So that's the only part that you are going to have to do anything with. You're going to have to punch some holes in this. Everything else you see here, it comes completely assembled and ready to wear. All you're going to have to do is pat it, punch a few holes in your elbow strap, and you're off to the races. So you can see here, I can make a full extension with no binding up whatsoever, and yet the side points of my elbow are still completely covered. And no matter which way I move my arm, it will stay covered. Okay? There are no gaps in coverage with my bazu band. The elbows, sides of the elbows were brought up high enough so that even with a weapon coming down with a full extension, you can't get to those bony points. Now something else that I do with mine, you're going to notice here that that wrist is not a straight line. Okay? Because your hand and your wrist are not straight lines. You look there, that extension part up here with your thumb needs more room to be able to move up and you need some room to be able to move down. So you can see here, I've got full range of motion with my wrist. Now, with these that are the layered design, you can see that there is a bit of distance between the reinforcing pieces and the end here. And that is so that you can shave this as needed to fine tune it for your wrist. There's a tool that uh, Tandy makes. It has a hooked end to it that has a razor blade in it. And you can use that for shaving and carving around the wrist section until it fits the way that you want it to fit. And then just take some 120 grit sandpaper, smooth down your edges, and then follow my maintenance instructions, which will be coming at the end of this video, and you'll be able to reseal the edges there. But for the most part, very few people have had to do a whole lot of shaving on there to get them to fit and feel comfortable around their wrist. Um, protective value. Well, obviously, your whole arm is covered, your elbow is covered, your wrist is covered, especially if you wear a uh, demi-gauntlet. Um, however, this is one of those interesting things to me about hardened leather versus steel plate and or plastic plate. Okay, The protective value of plated armor, whether it's plastic steel or leather, is in the way that it will distribute an impact. So instead of having a really sharp blow right on your bone right there with all of the force, being directed in that really tiny area, the plate, whether it's steel, plastic, or leather, takes that blow and distributes it, spreads it over the entire length of the plate. Now, with a steel plate or a plastic plate, to a certain extent, it's still going to hurt, even with padding behind it. Uh, because, again, all it's doing is distributing that blow. Plate, steel plate especially, does not really flex. Um, plastic can flex a little bit, but what I've learned with my hardened leather is that it flexes quite a bit. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because instead of just distributing the blow, because it's rigid, it's going to distribute it just like a steel or plastic plate would, uh, it tends to give a little more. And that helps to not only distribute the blow, but to absorb the blow. I'm going to give you a little anecdotal story here about my experience with steel arms and then my leather arms. And it goes back to when I first learned about bazu bands. Uh, I had been doing hardened leather for a little while 
but I was still wearing a 13th, 14th century articulated steel arm. Articulated elbow, plated steel forearms, and I had them completely lined with blue camping pad foam. And it didn't matter. It still hurt every time I got hit on my forearm. And that's not because they didn't fit properly. They they were made to my measurements. They were not generic. It still hurt. A friend of mine over in Silver Desert asked me to make him a set of bazoo bands because he was doing the German Lands Connect bit and he wanted hidden armor. And my first comment to him was, bazoo what? Because I'd never heard of the things before. So he showed me a picture and I said, yeah, I can probably make a set like that. And I made a set for him. And I liked the look and design of them so much, I decided to make a set for myself. So I actually didn't wear the first set that I ever made. That was for someone else. But I made a set for myself, and I lined them with the blue camping pad foam, just like I did with my, uh, with my steel ones. And back then, it wasn't even quite as thick a leather as what I'm using here. It was about 12 ounce leather compared to the 13 to 15 that I use uh, nowadays. And the first tournament that I went to to fight with them, um, the first thing I noticed was how light these were compared to my steel arms. My steel arms weighed about three and a half to four pounds each. And one of my Bosu bands weighs about a pound and a quarter, maybe. So there was a huge difference in weight, and they were very, very comfortable. And you know how sometimes when you're in the middle of a battle, you'll have those momentary lulls where the two of you just kind of stop for a moment, you take a breath or whatever, and each time I would get to one of those moments in the battle, I would stop and I would just glance at my arm because it was so comfortable and so light that I was sure at some point the arm had fallen off. Granted, I know the marshal would have said something if it had, but mentally, it just didn't feel the same, and so I was having to reassure myself constantly. Well, in that particular first bout, I was actually fighting uh, one of the Dukes of the West Kingdom, and I was fighting with a sword and shield, he was fighting with a great sword. And during the process of the fight, I came with a full flat snap towards his head, he threw a shot with his great sword, and it connected right there. With my arm coming forward at its full swing, him coming full swing, bam, right there in the leading forearm. And my arm went, bounce. And I stopped and I grinned at him. And he stopped and looked back at me, and he goes, what? And I went, it didn't hurt. And he went, oh, don't worry, I'll hit it harder next time. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't have to hit it any harder. It was fine. It was just, it didn't hurt. So that's an anecdotal thing from myself about my first experience with my Bazu bands versus the normal articulated steel that I was used to. Number one, these were much lighter. They were far more comfortable and they took an impact that normally would have had me groaning and having to stop fighting for a while. And instead, we just picked it up from there. And I got to fight the rest of the day with them. So that sold me on my Bosi bands from that point on. Um, so your weight to protection ratio on these, in my opinion, is really, really high. Okay, so padding. Uh, we just talked a bit about transmission shock and uh, blow absorption uh, values for leather. Well, I really strongly urge you to pad these up. Now, I know SCA regulations do not require padding in the forearm. You're going to have to pad the elbow, whether you do that by gluing it in or whether you use a elbow pad. Either one works fine. But the regulations do not require padding in this forearm. And when I take your measurements to make a set of these, I always leave room in them for padding. And I strongly suggest that you do pad them up. Now. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I have friends that just line them with lamb's wool. Uh, some people just use a padded gambeson sleeve, which is fine. I just go ahead and I pad mine up. And uh, I have a particular way that I do it, and that's what I'm going to show you here. Now, the first thing is, in terms of what you pad it with, camping pad foam is fine, just like 
blue camping pad foam. I've got some of this uh, dark stuff that you can get, this black stuff you can get at various SCA events. Uh, either one of these works fine. I prefer this because it's a little spongier, in my opinion, than the blue pant here, but it still works. Now, first thing that you're going to do is you're going to cut yourself an inch wide strip of this, and you're going to glue it in about an inch back from the edge of the wrist so it doesn't interfere with your wrist rotation here. Okay, I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see this with uh, the dark foam, but you're going to take an inch wide strip and you're going to glue it an inch back from the wrist on both sides, on the bottom side and on the forearm plate. Because that way when you close up the bazoo band and you, you buckle it closed, that's going to snug down on your forearm a bit and it's going to stop the bazoo band from sliding up and down on your arm too much. It's not going to prevent it entirely, but it, at least it'll restrict it a little bit. Then you're going to take another inch wide strip and you're going to glue it in right behind that, right down the leading edge of the forearm, all the way down into the elbow seam, maybe about an inch or so from the very end. And then you're going to make yourself some discs about yay big, cut a slit in it so that your straps can fit through, and you're going to glue those in on either side, and that takes care of all three points for your elbow. And that's it. You're going to notice it's not completely lined, not in the top, not along the sides here. That's going to promote airflow around your arm so it doesn't overheat. Some people, they don't realize that one of the reasons that their arm gets so tired while they're fighting is because they've got it so thoroughly padded up, whether because of padding in your armor or a gambeson sleeve, and it doesn't breathe enough that the heat causes your arm to cramp up, and that can actually fatigue your arm much faster. So we've got some airflow here, we've got airflow here, that stops your forearm from overheating. And that's all you need to do in terms of padding. Now when you glue your padding in, you're going to see here I got this nice big can of barges cement. Well, I do not recommend you use this for gluing your padding in, because this is a very permanent contact cement. It's commercial grade, it's normally used for putting boot soles on, so you know how permanent that is. Thing is that from time to time you're going to need to recondition this, which is what we're getting to now, and because of that you're going to need to be able to pull the padding out. And with this it's going to be very difficult to do. So you want to use just a normal household contact cement. Usually you can get it in a little tube at just about any hardware store. Uh, rubber cement will not hold very well in here, so really you want to use a contact cement as opposed to rubber cement. Okay, now in terms of the maintenance, maintenance on these is very simple. The instructions are on my website, scaldic.com, uh, but I'm going to give them to you here as well. Basically, you're going to take your padding out, you're going to preheat your oven to 200 degrees, you're going to put these in on a cookie sheet, and you're going to bake them for 15 minutes. Don't go over 20. 20 can cause them to be warped. Okay, But 15 minutes, take them out, let them cool, glue your padding back in, and you're ready to go. You can actually bake them as often as you want. I recommend at least twice a year. Personally, depending on how often you fight, every two months is probably a better idea. Um, but at least twice a year, you're going to want to bake them. Now you're going to notice on occasion, especially with the natural brown ones, that when you get hit on them, you're going to see these little spider web micro fractures on the surface. That's just a surface thing and when you recondition them in the oven, those are all going to blend out. I have customers that recondition theirs after each time they use them just for the cosmetic effect. But you really don't need to. Of course, the byproduct for them is because they're doing it each time, their armor stays rigid for a very long time. Uh, in terms of how long you can expect them to last, well, if you do the maintenance and take reasonable care of them, uh, you can expect a good three to five years easy. I have folks that don't take care of theirs at all. You have never reconditioned them, don't take care when they store them, and they get at least three years worth of wear out of them. And that was my old single layer design. These here you're looking at might be hard to see because it's all dark. These are my double layer design, and they tend to be even more durable. Um, but my very first pair of Bozzy bands, way back when, that didn't get all four stages of the hardening process, 
and back then I was fighting twice a week. They lasted me three years without ever reconditioning them. And again, that wasn't even as thick of leather as what I'm using here. So you should be able to get very significant wear time out of these if you just take a little bit of the care of them. Storage-wise, you can leave them in your car, that's no problem. If you're going to leave them inside the passenger area, just don't leave them where the sunlight can be refracted onto them through the windows, because that can get it up high enough that it could warp them. If you're going to leave them in the trunk, that's fine, just don't leave anything heavy on them, because less heat, but lots of pressure, can also misshape them. Um, Plastic tub is fine. Uh, personally, I use an NHL goaltender e uh, equipment hockey bag. Um, it has the benefit of being able to carry everything, has rollers on the end, nice solid plastic bottom. It also is ventilated so that it doesn't get too humid in the bag. Uh, humidity isn't really going to bother these too much because they do go through a full immersion wax bath and that wax bath pretty much stops mold or mildew from getting into the leather. It can, however, show up on the surface. If that happens, just wipe it off and then uh, give them an oven bake and you should be fine. Never, ever, ever use oil or creams, leather conditioning oils or leather conditioning creams on my hardened leather. Okay? Remember, conditioners and creams are for softening leather. You don't want to soften this, so don't use those. If you do notice, however, through combat you get a really deep cut on here, just get yourself a small cake of beeswax, give it a rub along that, and then bake them in the oven, and that should seal it up. So that's all there is to it in terms of maintenance and measurement on, uh, maintenance on these. So thank you very much. I hope I've answered all your questions. And uh, go out there, have fun, and be safe.